So, uh, we will continue our uh, discussion in this uh, module 2. So, in the in this particular lecture. So, in the, um, the previous uh, section what we discussed uh, was basically I introduced uh, this um, uh, yield locus. Okay. So, uh, we know how to find the onset of plastic deformation or yielding occurs when you go for uniaxial type of deformation. Now, you have general state of deformation uh, and in that we consider plain stress because of sheet deformation. So, we need something called as a yield locus that is what we discussed in the uh, previous section. So, uh, uh, we are going to uh, continue our discussion um, you know here. Okay. So, uh, so this yield locus or uh, yield surfaces in 3D okay, can be described in the form of uh, some uh, expressions or equations okay. and uh, they follow uh, something called as yield functions or yield criterion as said here. Okay. And there are several uh, yield functions or yield criteria available for uh, the materials that we are discussing. Okay. So, we will discuss some of them in this uh, particular subject. So, the first one is basically called as a Tresca yield criterion. We are going to discuss one more uh, yield function after this. Okay. And after that, you know, little later in this course, we are going to introduce uh, two, three other very briefly, two, three other yield functions, okay, not in detail. Okay. So, these two we are going to discuss in detail. The first one is uh, called as a Tresca uh, yield function or yield criterion. So, the statement as per this Tresca yield criterion, okay, uh, it goes like this. The statement is yielding occurs, okay, so or yield point is reached, you can say yielding occurs when the greatest maximum shear stress reaches a critical value. Greatest maximum shear stress reaches a critical value. So, uh, in the previous section, we have seen tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. Okay. So, uh, in that the greatest one, okay, if it whenever reaches a critical value, then we say that um, yielding occurs as per this uh, criteria. Okay. So, uh, the greatest is basically you can say for example, in general if you want to write it in the form of an equation, we can say we had uh, in, the, in the previous uh, you know section we had tau 1, tau 2, tau 3 uh, which will be uh, sigma 1. Say for example, uh, we said uh, here that it is sigma 1 minus uh, uh, 2 minus 3 divided by 2, sigma 2 minus sigma 3 divided by 2 and sigma 3 minus 1 divided by 2, is not it? So, out of this we are going to pick up 1 uh, in particular, but in general we can say sigma max minus sigma min divided by 2 okay. and if it reaches a critical value, so what is the critical value okay, can be obtained uh, by using uniaxial tensile test type of situation where sigma 2 and 3 are actually 0. Okay. If you put that in any one of the equations, let us say 2 and 3 are 0. So, then there will be sigma 1 by 2 only and that sigma 1 we, we are going to call it as sigma f. So, the tau critical can be written as a sigma f divided by 2. So, I am going to write in general that sigma max minus sigma uh, minimum divided by 2 is equal to this tau critical which is nothing but sigma f by 2 which can be written in this form. And uh, with the convention generally uh, if you find all the principal stresses let us say sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 okay, in the previous uh, section I was telling you one should know how to find this principal stresses given a stress tensor, but then uh, if you know how to find out this then it can be arranged in this convention. Okay, sigma 1 is generally greater than or equal to sigma 2 which is also greater than or equal to sigma 3. This is the convention with which we are going to arrange it. So, if we arrange it like this then out of tau 1, tau 2, tau 3 we are going to pick up only one okay, uh, tau that will that can be written as sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is equal to sigma f where this would be the highest value and this will be the lowest value we can say sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is equal to sigma f. Okay. So, uh, now if you see that uh, we put a condition that if it is uniaxial tensile test for example, to test it then sigma 3 anyway is going to be 0. So, sigma 1 will be equal to sigma f, sigma 1 will be equal to sigma f. So, sigma f is nothing but your uh, yield strength or in general you can say flow stress. Okay. Flow stress means uh, the first time it is is going to yield let us say that is nothing but your yield strength. So, we are going to use sigma f uh, you know uniformly in all the slides. Okay. So, now if you consider uniaxial tensile test then sigma 1 will become sigma f if that is the case then yielding will start is the uh, thing that we already know that we already discussed in the first uh, section itself whenever reaching the uh, yield strength material is going to enter into plastic deformation. Right. So, now we are going to have another case like in axial you have this you also have yielding in pure shear okay that condition can be written as sigma 1 is equal to k and sigma 3 is equal to minus sigma 1 is equal to minus k 
okay so sigma 3 is equal to minus sigma 1 is nothing but your pure shear they are equal and opposite in nature they are equal and opposite in nature and that will be equal to minus k what is k here k is the shear yield strength of the material this should not be confused with strength coefficient that we have studied in the previous section sigma is equal to k epsilon power n that k is called as strength coefficient that is different this k is called as shear yield strength so during shear deformation there must be some yield strength okay and that is called as a small k here okay so when we say sigma 1 is equal to k and sigma 3 is equal to minus sigma 1 they are opposite in nature and equal that will be equal to minus k okay then under pure shear we can write this equation sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is equal to 2k so if you can substitute it here you will get 2k sigma 1 is equal to k minus sigma 3 is equal to minus k so plus it will become 2k it will become 2k right so here one should note that there is no sigma 2 part at all in this equation okay in both the equations there is no sigma 2 coming into picture because we are referring to 1 and 3 okay so now combined way of writing this okay uh, with respect to your this this particular equation okay and uh, combining this equation with this so tesca yield criterion can be written as sigma 1 minus 3 is equal to sigma f is equal to 2k okay this is the appropriate expression important expression with respect to tesca yield function and uh, you can say that this also gives you relationship between uniaxial yield strength to shear yield strength which is nothing but sigma f is equal to 2k okay so your uh, uniaxial yield strength will be twice that of your shear yield strength okay or if you want to find k then you can divide this by 2 which will give you k okay so shear yield strength of any material if you want to find out if we follow a tresca yield function then it would be generally sigma f by 2 okay so this tresca yield function generally uh, can be drawn in a, in a plane of paper in this format okay this is just a schematic of uh, you know the tresca yield function and it's generally uh, written as a hexagon which is not actually regular in nature okay it is drawn as a hexagon which is not regular it's not a regular hexagon okay so we are going to draw between sigma 1 and sigma 3 in this case okay and uh, you are going to say that uh, uh, so you have uh, this kind of hexagon i am just redrawing here this is the second zone third zone fourth zone then you have fifth zone then you have sixth zone okay so zone 1 2 3 4 5 6 so in all this uh, zones you can show the state of stress as uh, schematically i have drawn here okay so uh, one should also know that when you follow one particular alpha when you follow one particular alpha alpha you know sigma 2 by alpha is nothing but sigma 2 divided by sigma 1 that is a proportional path we are going to pick up then once we reach here it means we are entering into plastic deformation so on set of plastic deformation would be there so our yielding is going to start that is why you are written as alpha this alpha could be any alpha in this space okay so in this six zones you will see the first one uh, you will see that uh, both are pulling type okay this is if you pick up an element from a material which will be in this in this zone let us say zone number one okay you will see that uh, this element will be pulled in both the directions tensile in nature if you come to second zone the same element okay will be in pulling only but different proportion but they will have different proportion maybe you should pick up one alpha here they will have different proportion if you come to zone number three okay so uh, you will see that one will be pulling another will be compression one will be in tension other one will be in compression isn't it so your sigma one is negative isn't it so sigma one is actually negative so sigma three is anyway positive here now come to zone four okay so both will be compression okay both the axis both the elements will be compression in both the sides okay same case in five also but five will be of different proportion as compared to four and when you come to six six is just opposite to this so you will have pulling on one side but pushing on the other side compression side but it is sigma one and sigma three so sigma one is pulling and sigma three is actually uh, compression type okay so you may see uh, in sheet deformation sheet forming process if you want to make any component you may end up in different state of stress like this at different locations and as per this particular alpha you are going to uh, reach the uh, the yield uh, point in that particular locus that is the meaning of this okay so uh, now during strain hardening okay this is the first yield locus in the previous uh, section we have discussed that the first locus is nothing but the initial yield locus we say so we can call this as let us say initial yield locus 
okay we can we can call it as initial yield locus now with further deformation because of strain hardening what will happen your sigma f will try to increase okay so you can see that uh, sigma 3 is 0 okay sigma 1 will be sigma f here. this is what this equation is going to tell you now this is what this equation is going to tell you when sigma 3 is 0 sigma 1 is equal to sigma f that is your uniaxial yield strength here okay if this is initial yield locus okay so with the strain hardening the sigma f is going to increase okay so this is very brief idea about tresca yield function which is going to tell you when the material is going to start plastically deforming or it will start permanently yielding now a similar one which is also very uh, you know profoundly used in a metal forming is nothing but von meisser yield function or von meisser yield criterion okay so what is the statement here when the root mean square value of maximum shear stress reaches a critical value yielding is going to start that is the statement when the root mean square value of the maximum shear stresses okay so you have tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 with respect to that you have to get root mean square and if it reaches a critical value then we say yielding is going to start so this is what is written here okay this is a root then it is mean of the square terms so tau 1 square plus tau 2 square by tau 3 square divided by 3 when it reaches a critical value yielding will start so what is the critical value we do not know so what are we going to do is again we are going to use our own friend that is your uniaxial tensile test which is easy for us to put the condition so you know that sigma 1 exists in sigma 1 is going to be there there is some value for sigma 1 in this sigma 2 and 3 are going to be 0 so what is tau 1 tau 1 would be sigma 1 by 2 tau 2 is going to be fully 0 because 2 and 3 will be there tau 3 you are going to have minus sigma 1 by right so i am going to substitute all these things in this equation okay so tau 1 square is sigma 1 by 2 whole square plus 0 plus sigma 1 by 2 the whole square you can say minus here does not matter okay so then it will be 2 times of uh, your sigma 1 by 2 the whole square so there is only one uh, sigma here principal stress so i am going to use f just nothing but my sigma f sigma 1 becomes sigma f here in general sigma f okay because there is only one sigma here okay so if you uh, calculate uh, this particular function then finally you can write uh, this three anyway will go off okay you can write uh, square root of uh, two times of uh, tau one square plus tau two square plus tau three square is equal to sigma f this is the first level of equation for one meisser seal function though this is not used uh, you know uh, mostly okay because there is tau one tau two tau three which can be related to sigma one two three and that will be the best equation to use uh, for any uh, sheet deformation or any metal deformation process if you want to model it so okay so now this since this is one stage of uh, you know equation of course this is one expression for one mice as you can see now instead of tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 okay so i am going to write this in terms of principal stresses okay so again sigma 1 comma sigma 2 comma sigma 3 i want to rewrite this entire thing tau 1 tau 2 tau 3 now because you know what is tau 1 what is tau 2 and what is tau 3 in terms of sigma 1 2 3 we have studied that I have not derived it here, but it is for you to work it out on a small you know paper. Okay, you can easily get it. So if you substitute tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, instead of that, if you write sigma 1 minus 2 by 2, 2 minus 3 by 2, and 1 minus 3 by 2, and then substitute here and then solve that equation, finally you will get this particular form, which is nothing but square root of half into sigma 1 minus 2 the whole square plus 2 minus 3 the whole square plus 3 minus 1 the whole square. You close the bracket, it will be equal to your sigma f. This is also written in several resources as sigma 1 minus 2 the whole square plus 2 minus 3 the whole square plus 3 minus 1 the whole square is equal to 2 times of sigma f square. Okay, You take square in both sides and then bring 2 here, it will be 2 sigma f square, it will be 2 sigma f square. So that is a one, this is one important you know uh, stage of this your one meisser equation and this is a famous equation with respect to one meisser hill function. So now we can also rewrite this equation in terms of deviatoric stresses. Okay. So why? Because you can always write a sigma 1, 2, 3 as a function of sigma 1 dash, 2 dash, 3 dash. These are all deviatoric stresses. Right. So the sigma 1, 2, and 3 can be related to sigma 1, can be related to sigma 2 and sigma 3 in this way. Okay, sigma 1 dash is equal to 2 sigma 1 minus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 divided by 3. This we have studied before. This we got it uh, when we discussed about the hydrostatic stress. You remove hydrostatic part from your general state of stress, then you will get a sigma 1 dash, 2 dash, 3 dash that we already discussed. I am putting etc. here, which means 
like sigma 1 dash you have sigma 2 dash and you have sigma 3 dash equation which you have to use okay and rewrite that sigma 1 dash 2 dash 3 dash okay in terms of uh, uh, or rewrite sigma 1 2 3 in terms of sigma 1 dash 2 dash 3 dash and then you have to substitute it in this equation and uh, some steps are available then finally you will get a yield condition as a square root of 3 by 2 into sigma 1 dash square plus sigma 2 dash square plus sigma 3 dash square that will be equal to your sigma f okay so this is another form of uh, same equation okay so either this form or this form is majorly used well known form or this form can also be seen in the form of uh, uh, to describe your von Mises yield function. Okay. Again I am reporting here that like sigma 1 dash you need to have equations for 2 dash and 3 dash and rewrite your sigma 1, 2, 3 in terms of 1 dash, 2 dash, 3 dash so that you can substitute in this equation and you will get this particular equation after a few steps and uh, this also in a way tells you about von Mises yield criterion. Okay. So, Tresca and von Mises yield condition they have a different statement okay, but finally will tell you when material is going to yield. So, if you pick up this particular equation which is predominantly used okay, which is predominantly used you will see that the nomenclatures are sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 are again principal stresses and sigma f is nothing but your um, yield strength of the material or we can simply say sigma f here. So, now this is I am going to pick up this equation. Uh, this is a very famous equation. We are going to pick up this equation and if I am going to go put a plain stress, if I want to put plain stress condition here, that means sigma 3 is going to become 0. Sigma 3 is going to become 0. So, this fellow will go off and this fellow will go off. Okay. So, this you have to expand. A minus b the whole square. This is sigma 2 square. This is minus sigma 1 square. So, sigma 1 square. Okay. So, that is what I am going to do it here because we say sheets are uh, going to follow a plain stress type of deformation during any component manufacturing. So, you can uh, rewrite the previous equation okay, the form of sigma 1 and sigma 2 when you go for plane stress. So, plane stress meaning sigma 3 will be equal to 0 here. Okay. In the previous equation if you substitute it you will get this particular equation okay. and this equation can be further uh, simplified as this in this form. Okay. So, uh, because this is 2 sigma 1 square then 2 sigma 2 square is this okay. then 2 will come out all will be cancelled. So, you have sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square minus sigma 1 sigma 2 is equal to sigma f and since it is a function of sigma 1 and sigma 2, I can rewrite this in terms of uh, alpha. Alpha is nothing but sigma 2 by sigma 1 which will give me a simple equation square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square into sigma 1 which is nothing but my sigma f. Right. So, uh, so what does it mean? If we closely look into, look into it, so if I know uh, sigma 1 and if I know alpha, I can get sigma 2 let us say or if I know sigma 1 and alpha, okay, then I can substitute in this equation and I can check okay, if it is equal to sigma f or not. If that is going to happen, the material is going to yield. Okay. So, this equation okay, in principal stress space because a function of sigma 1 and sigma 2 okay, can be drawn in this fashion. Okay, sigma 1 in y axis, sigma 2 in x axis if you see, okay, it is generally in the form of a fantastic ellipse okay and uh, the same alpha which i mentioned in tresca is written here okay you pick up one path if it reaches this particular locus here then you are into p p means plastic deformation so yielding is there and after that you are going to have a plastic deformation that's the meaning right so you can follow any alpha you want okay so uh, this is a one minus a locus in plane stress condition Okay, one minus locus in plane stress condition, which is an ellipse actually. Okay, one minus locus in plane stress is going to be an ellipse like this, which can be drawn like this. Okay, and this fellow is going to be your sigma f. This also uniaxial your sigma f yield strength if it is initial yield locus. If it is initial yield locus, this is your sigma f. You can also put that condition. Say for example, if you put a, a sigma one as zero here. Okay, so then it will be sigma f would be sigma 2 will be equal to sigma f. So, you can check it. Okay, sigma 1 is uh, let us say sigma 2 is 0. Okay, so, this fellow will go, this fellow will go square root. So, sigma 1 is equal to sigma f. Okay, so, in that way you can evaluate. And uh, it can also be shown that uh, the for this is an ellipse. right? So, this is a semi major axis. It can be written as a square root of 2 into sigma f and semi minor axis can be written as square root of 2 by 3 into sigma f and uh, I have shown a small derivation here for that. 
So uh, same diagram, okay. So y axis sigma one and sigma two here, okay. Sigma one and uh, sigma two here, and uh, let us pick up uh, one particular uh, stress path, okay, defined by sigma two is equal to sigma one. So alpha is equal to one, you can say. Sigma is equal to sigma one, and I am going to reach this particular point. Let us assume that this is reaching the yield locus. This reached the yield locus. Okay, this distance I am going to call it as small y. Let us say, okay. So means because it is reaching yield locus, I can say this could be one sigma f in that particular locus. So this is my first equation which I have derived before, right? So square root of sigma one square minus sigma one sigma two plus sigma two square is equal to sigma f, right? So this is nothing but my this equation, this particular equation, minus sigma one sigma two sigma two square, correct? So now. Uh, in this uh, particular path, I can say sigma one is equal to sigma two. Okay, so when I am substituting it here, you will find out this particular simple expression: sigma one is equal to sigma two is equal to sigma f, which is also mentioned in that diagram. Okay, so now what is a from this figure? A is nothing but square root of sigma one square plus sigma two square. Okay, so I am going to replace it here. Okay, with this condition: so square root of uh, sigma f square plus sigma f square. It is nothing but square root of two into sigma f. So two times square root of two sigma f will become square will become sigma f, okay? Which is what we have shown in that semi-major axis, right? So this will square root of two into sigma f. So uh, when you go to uh, the other zone, when you go to the next zone, let us say you are going to pick up this side, okay? You are going to pick up this side, okay? This this should be like this, okay? If you are going to pick up this particular side, okay? So then uh, what we are going to or in the other side. We can say same sigma one, sigma two is there. So I am going to pick up this particular point, which is let us say touching the yield locus. Okay, and this B strain path can be written as, or a stress path can be written as sigma one is equal to minus sigma two. Okay, minus sigma two. When it reaches yield locus, I am going to call this uh, location as sigma f. Okay, so now same equation. When sigma one is equal to minus sigma two, so I will get sigma one is equal to sigma f by square root of three. You can check it. So now this B figure will is going to tell you. Square root of sigma one square plus sigma two square, which is nothing but square root of. Uh, you can substitute these two, you know, conditions here. Okay, and finally you will get uh, square root of two by three into sigma f. Okay, in this way one can prove that uh, your uh, a, which is uh, uh, a semi-major axis, and b, which is uh, semi-minor axis, as uh, square root of two sigma f and square root of two by three into sigma f. Uh, in many resources, this ratio they mention. Okay. Uh, the ratio is mentioned. Okay, you are major to minor ratio. So square root of two into sigma f divided by square root of two by three into sigma f. This ratio, okay, you can calculate what is it? It's it could be root three is to one. Be root three is to one. So that is also very important result for us. Okay. So now let us take uh, for example, if you take one minus you know uh, yield locus. Uh, so one minus yield locus. Why do you see such situations? Just uh, example I am telling you. Okay, this is uh, basically uh, I would say this is basically a partially I will say drawn cup. Okay, you can say a partially drawn cup, right? So uh, if you rotate it through 360 degree, you will get a full cup, and this is actually called as a flange region, right? And this is your cup wall. This we already introduced in the first class, and this is your cup bottom. Okay, cup bottom region, right? So this is just one quarter of that. A part of that uh, is shown in this diagram. Okay, so for easy understanding, okay, and this is your sheet thickness. Okay, this is your sheet thickness, instantaneous thickness, you can say. Okay, and this was your initial sheet. This is your initial situation, and it is partially drawn to this much of height. Okay, so now this is a conventional yield locus and an elliptical yield locus is drawn. Only a part is drawn, just for explanation. So now, where are these situations? Suppose you pick up this particular stress path. Okay, if you particular this particular alpha, let us say, it is called as a biaxial. It is called as biaxial deformation because your sigma one and two is going to be equal. Okay, so that means an element which is undergoing this type of deformation will have this type of pulling. Okay, it is pulled in both the directions. Okay. You will see this type of situation in your cup bottom. You can see here, in a cup bottom, you will see that this particular element is actually pulled in both the directions. Now, if you pick up a plane strain, why it is a plane strain? We will see later on because this is sigma one versus sigma two, and I am going to call this as plane strain that you will see later. But then you can assume this as a plane strain process. Okay, 
the same sheet which is deformed along this alpha which is equivalent to plane strain type of deformation. Still it is plane stress because sigma 3 is not in the diagram. Okay. So, if that is the case then what is the meaning? It means that it is actually pulled in only one direction rather in the, in the other direction the strain is not that much. So, you can keep it as a plane strain that is the meaning we will see that later on. This type of situation you will see in cup wall region. Okay. So, if you come to this one this 45 degree uh, is actually called as pure shear. Okay. The same thing which we discussed in the uh, previous one no? this one. Okay. It is pure shear let us say which means that one will be equal and opposite to the other one. Okay. That means uh, it is getting pulled here okay, and this is getting compressed here. This type of situation we will see in, we'll see in the flange region okay, because here you will see that one is actually pushed the other one is actually pulled. Okay. So, this type of situations are seen you get to see that center that means cup center and in the wall region and in the flange region. Okay, just to give you some example why it is important that is what I was telling you when you deform a sheet different locations may have different this kind of state of stress which can be obtained from the yield locus. Okay, so, now I am going to draw a 3D figure of these two yield functions or these two yield criterion and they are going to be called as yield surfaces. Okay. So, if it is uniaxial type of deformation is just one point called yield strength. If it is in 2D on paper okay, then in plane stress type of deformation you have sigma 1 and sigma 2. So, you have a curve that is called yield locus we decided. Okay. And then now if sigma 3 is also there okay, then this is become a surface okay. that is a 3D plot. So, how are they going to uh, you know compare? So, Von Mises and Tresca can be compared in this way. This is a standard diagram you can see in many textbooks. So, I have referred to one of the textbooks. You can say that, uh, so this can be plotted like this. There are a lot of features in this. First of all, you can see that there is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 axis, uh, principal stress axis. That is what I have written as geometric representation of yield criteria, these two in principal stress space, in principal stress space. So, uh, what are the features here? Axis sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 are there and then Okay, you will see that there are two yield surfaces. The black one I have written as Von Mises yield locus or uh, is part of yield surface and uh, Tresca yield locus or you can call the entire surface which is going to be generated in 3D form as yield Tresca yield surface. Okay. Generally, this Tresca is inscribed inside Von Mises yield surface. That is the way you generally uh, keep it. So, that is why I have given this, this gray, this blue one is actually inside this cylinder. Okay. This hexagonal 3D structure is actually inside the regular cylinder. Okay, that is the way it is drawn. Okay. So, and uh, the center of this, this axis you can call this is called actually hydrostatic line. Hydrostatic line means uh, we said hydrostatic stress sigma h, right? So, in that case, you will see that sigma 1 will be equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma 3 in the hydrostatic line. Okay. So, now okay, uh, there is one particular plane called deviatory plane which is described by sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 equal to 0 that is going to cut this hydrostatic line perpendicular in a perpendicular manner that is what it is drawn. Okay. So, there is a plane you can imagine okay, there is a cylinder you can you can you can imagine like a tube like a metallic tube or something like that it is the cylinder given here regular cylinder which is representing one masses and I am going to cut you know perpendicular to its axis. So, I am going to get a plane no that is nothing but your deviatric plane which is described by sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 is equal to 0. So, now there is a projection of this locus on the deviatoric plane correct. So, there is you are since you are going to cut it okay. So, this shapes two shapes will also be cut right and that is what I have inscribed here. So, this this black line okay is uh, my one minus again and this black line this hexagon okay is my Tusca yield locus on the deviatoric plane on the deviatoric plane. Okay. So, these are the features you have here. Okay. So, I am going to uh, write uh, this one minus yield surface it is radius is nothing but square root of 2 by 3 into sigma y. Okay. So, we have proved it is uh, one of the you know uh, semi axis okay. one of the axis is nothing but square root of 2 by 3 into sigma y. Now, one minus surface has got radius square root of 2 by 3 into sigma y that is one thing you should know. So, I have written here that Von Mises is actually right circular cylinder okay, and Tresca is going to be your regular hexagonal prism 
and this regular hexagon prism is actually put inside your one meshes in this fashion. Okay. So now these are different uh, ways of drawing your surfaces. Truss curve we have drawn separately, one meshes we have drawn separately in 3D format. This is the way you can draw. So now this diagram also I am going to use to discuss one important thing which I was discussing with you previously that uh, why hydrostatic part or stress does not affect yielding. We removed that, isn't it? And then we said that only deviatoric part is going to play a role, right? Why is it so? Can be explained from this particular diagram given here. So I am going to consider a state of stress OA. Okay, I have given here OA. You consider state of stress. Okay, so this OA now can be uh, you know uh, resolved into two components OB that is one another vector and OC is another vector. Okay, so this OB is along the hydrostatic part. There is an equivalent component to that uh, in deviatoric plane that is OC. So OB is in hydrostatic part is the hydrostatic part of OA and OC is a deviatoric part of the same OA. Okay. So, because your state of stress can be divided into two parts hydrostatic plus deviatoric right. So, that is what I have drawn here. So, OB this vector is along the hydrostatic line which is nothing but a hydrostatic part. OC is actually on the deviatoric plane and it is a deviatoric part of OA. Right. So, now what I am going to do is uh, assuming that this A OA is actually in elastic state. A part is not reach the yield surface. A part is not reach the yield surface, right? So when it reaches yield surface, we say that material is started yielding. Plastic deformation is going to start after that. So now the point here is, so any deformation, if I want to increase OA without contributing from OC, okay? So without sorry, without contribution from OB, which is a hydrostatic part, okay? So let us say for example, if I want to increase OA with a contribution only from OB. Okay? So only OB is going to increase. Let us say for example, only hydrostatic part is going to increase. So with the same OC, okay, what will happen? This A will never reach the yield surface. Okay? So OA, I want to increase its length or by increasing the deformation, let us say OA, I have to deform further. right? So, so that has got contribution only from OB, let us say. Okay, so it means that OC is not going to increase. Let us say then, what does it mean? It means this this point will never reach the yield surface if you have contribution only from OB. Okay, so which means OC has to have some contribution to OA only then this A point will reach this yield locus here. Okay, or yield surface here, and then yielding is going to start. Okay, so that's why we always say that this hydrostatic part is not going to play any role. Okay, in the onset of plastic deformation or yielding. So the contribution OB alone, if you take, then A part will not reach the yield surface. You need to have contribution from OC to push this A to the plastic deformation or onset of yielding. Okay? That is why your hydrostatic part will not play any role in the onset of plastic deformation or yielding. But this A point can reach either one meshes yield locus or Tresco yield locus, uh, you know, depending on which model you are going to use depending on which model you are going to use. And uh, for a given value of alpha, it is said that these two gradient predict less than 15 percent difference. So maximum difference it can have is only 15 percent between your Von Mises and Tresca yield function. That is generally said. And uh, you should also note down one important point, this Von Mises and Tresca are meant for isotopic materials. That is why there is no intimation of plastic strain ratio or any other equivalent term in any of these equations. There is no intimation of uh, R, R is kept as 1 no, for isotropic material, no? right? So, there is no intimation of R or including R in any of this equation. Okay? So, I hope you understand this particular part, why hydrostatic part does not affect yielding is mainly because if OA has to further increase and reach the surface, if it has got contribution only from OB, then A will not reach the surface, it has to have contribution from OC. Okay? But which yield surface is going to reach first? Generally, it is going to be Tresca. Okay, if that is the case, it will yield according to Sesca yield function, but they may have a maximum difference of, of the order of 15 percentage in one particular alpha. Okay, and these two are meant for isotropic yield functions. Okay, so with this, I am going ahead. So this these two yield locus, uh, you know, or yield loci, okay, can be drawn on the deviatoric plane. On the deviatoric plane, deviatoric plane is this plane, right? 
So you see from this side, okay, you see from this side that means you are going to cut the hydrostatic part with the surface and on that how do they look like? It will look like this. These two will look like this. Okay, this is the loci of Mises or one Mises and yield surfaces on the deviatoric plane. Okay, one should note that sigma 1, sigma 2 axis are not on the deviatoric plane. Let us be careful, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, these are not actually on the deviatoric plane. Okay, so how do they look like? When the state of stress such that its hydrostatic part is 0, okay, when the hydrostatic part is 0, then you have only deviatoric part, okay, and the geometric representation reduces to 2. Uh, you know uh, yield locus on the deviatoric plane. How are they going to look like? Okay, one is basically one Mises criterion which will look like a, a circle with radius square root of 2 by 3 into sigma y. That is what we have mentioned in the previous 3D plot also which is represented here. Okay, square root of 2 by 3 into sigma y. Okay, this is the radius. Okay, and uh, Tresca would be a regular hexagon okay, which is inside one Mises circle. Okay, this is a one Mises circle. Okay, and this is your uh, you know Tresca hexagon, this is a Tresca hexagon, Tresca hexagon is going to be inside your Mon Mises uh, circle which is one Mises circle has got a radius square root of 2 by 3 into sigma y and this diagram also gives you several state of stress you can see here. This all are basically denoting Tresca yield functions at different uh, locations. Okay. So, how do you get these two yield locus? These two yield locus are obtained by generated by intersection of yield surface with the deviatoric plane. That is what uh, intersection is this, where they are interact intersection is this. It is intersected by deviatoric plane, so you are going to have these two. They are called yield loci on deviatoric plane. Okay? They are called yield loci on the deviatoric plane. Okay? So, uh, you can imagine that uh, this is plane stress, this is plane stress sigma 3 is equal to 0 okay? and in principle stress space both are there. Principal stress space sigma 1 is a sigma 2 okay, principal stress space okay, and sigma 3 is equal to 0. Okay. This one is sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 all are shown with a 3D figure and they are going to called as yield surfaces. And these two yield locus can be compared on the deviatoric plane in this fashion. Okay. So, different figures are there one has to be really careful with this and this also is discussed in terms of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 only. Okay. So, I am going to move ahead with this. So, these are the two yield functions which are very important for us and uh, as discussed in the previous uh, slide, you should know that these two are meant for isotropic uh, materials. For anisotropic sheets, anisotropic materials, we will see later on okay, very briefly what are the important yield functions where R also comes into picture, plastic stain ratio. Now, when we speak about uh, this yield functions, okay, there are two important things, one is a normality and other one is a convexity. These two can be explained in this way. Okay. So, what is this? Okay. So, uh, it will lead to two important things that one should know. Okay. Suppose uh, to start with, uh, let us pick up a stress strain diagram okay, like this. Okay. Let us pick up a stress strain diagram like this. The elastic part is actually zoomed in and little drawn in a bigger way. Okay. And this part is actually transition between elastic to plastic. You can say this is nothing but your yield strength, let us say sigma f, flow stress, yield strength. Okay. So, sigma a is essentially an elastic part and uh, sigma b, I am going to pick up a uh, you know, plastic stress and uh, this loop, this loop okay, is nothing but a cycle for me. So, I am going to start from here, okay. I am going to consider a loop which is starting from sigma a which is an elastic part and I am going to pick up one plastic part and I am going to go along the hardening part okay, and I am going to go along the hardening part and I am going to come down and I will reach the initial point and I will going to close that loop. That cycle is closed. Okay. Cycle is closed. So, it starts with the sigma A goes to sigma B and then the envelope is created by the hardening part of the stress strain graph it decreases and it closes the loop. The arrow mark is given here for your reference. Okay. So, uh, this I am going to call it as a D epsilon P plastic strain increment, okay. plastic strain increment okay. and uh, this rise in sigma I am going to call it as a D sigma. This rise in sigma is going to call it as D sigma. This D sigma basically signifies hardening in this loop correct because from 
let us say this strain, let us say this strain, the material has hardened this much, right. So, I am going to call it as d sigma, okay. So, this brown color 1 is the area of the rectangle that is going to give me my work done. I am just going to call it as w2, which is nothing but my sigma b minus sigma a into d epsilon p, okay. So, and this can be seen in the form of a triangle and I am going to call it as w1 as a work done during this cycle is nothing but half into d epsilon p into d sigma, okay. So, area of triangle is w1 and this is w2. It is going to be my work done in these two regions and work done along the closed path is w which is nothing but w1 plus w2 where I am going to write uh, this plus this is a total work done along this particular closed path which has got boundary between sigma a, sigma b and the strain hardening region. So, now if you see in this equation, the equation is good because if sigma f, d epsilon p sorry is 0, uh, d epsilon p is 0 means work done is 0. So, no work done w0 which means it is a pure elastic response. Right, it means it is a pure elastic response. So, now these are the two parts, right? Sigma b minus sigma a into d epsilon p and half into d epsilon p into d sigma. I am going to pick up this particular part first and I am written here. These two points are very important for us. I am going to say that the sigma b minus sigma a into d epsilon p is should be strictly positive. It should be strictly positive, okay, because d epsilon p cannot be 0, okay, it is anyway, it is going to, uh, it is an increment, okay, plastic strain increment, okay. Then this product has to be strictly positive only then plastic deformation is going to happen. Why? Because then sigma b is going to be larger than sigma a. Sigma b should always be larger than sigma a only then this will remain strictly positive for me. Okay. That is number 1. And number 2, this half into d epsilon p into d sigma also should be positive. That means your d sigma should also be positive for me. It is also signifies that strain hardening is going to happen strain hardening is going to happen, right. If this is not going to be positive negative, then it means that uh, there is a d sigma which is going to be negative, which is actually due to the downfall of uh, your true stress or load like that, which is not describing your strain hardening behavior, okay. So, my this product sigma b minus sigma in d epsilon p should be strictly positive, half d epsilon p d sigma should also be strictly positive, okay, which means my w1, this fellow and W2 both should be greater than 0 for a stable plastic response. Stable plastic response means the way we understand plastic response, right. Start with this deformation, cross the yield point, okay, elastic point where part is covered, then you have to go for plastic deformation, strain hardening is going to happen, okay. If that has to happen, then this work done, W1 should be greater than 0 and W2 should also be greater than 0. That is a very important condition for that, okay. So, now convexity. Okay, let us pick up one thing, convexity. This convexity is going to tell you why yield locus is convex at each and every point in that locus. Okay, why yield locus is convex? Let us say sigma 2 versus sigma 1 we have. Let us pick up first quadrant. You take any point and put a tangent here. Okay, so we say that the material has to have maintained this, sorry, this, this point should be, uh, the, the, the yield locus should be convex at each and every point in that particular yield locus. Why is it so? Okay, so, for that we are going to consider a case just opposite to that. This is actually the yield locus. Uh, this is actually your yield locus let us say and there is a small region where it, there is a small dip. It is going to come down, it is going to increase like that. Okay. So, I am going to map the sigma a, okay, the same sigma a here, sigma a, sigma b, I am going to map it like this. So, sigma, uh, this diagram you will see sigma a is elastic. So, I am going to keep it below the yield locus, correct? Sigma b is on the E locus because it is in plastic deformation, okay, because it is in plastic part, but A is still in the elastic part, let us say it is inside the E locus, okay. So, now you will see that the main requirement is a sigma b minus sigma a into d epsilon p should be greater than 0. So, I am going to pick up uh, this particular part, I am going to pick up this particular part, see this particular part, okay, my uh, w2 part, okay, that is the main requirement, why? Otherwise, uh, you will not have uh, stable plastic response, okay. This means, this means that sigma b should be greater than sigma a, otherwise plastic deformation will not happen. In this figure, you will see that sigma a looks larger than sigma b, which is actually not acceptable, which means that the sigma b minus sigma a has negative projection on d epsilon, which also means that your w1 is actually less than 0. But for stable plastic response, we said that your w1 should be greater than 0.
okay so this is not accepted that is happening why why because sigma a is greater than sigma b which is forbidden from plasticity point of view okay so we can also say that no elastic states can be available outside the tangent line to the yield locus so you draw a tangent line to the yield locus okay at any point here 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 okay so let us pick up this particular point you are drawing a tangent let us say for example no elastic states can be available outside the tangent line so there is here sigma a which is actually in elastic part okay sigma a is an elastic part which is actually beyond the tangent line to the yield locus okay so always sigma b should be greater than sigma a this is possible only when the yield locus is convex at every point this is possible only when you have a yield locus which is a convex at every point this is an important condition so this should be greater than 0 only then your work done is greater than 0 that is point number 1 next one is there is something called normality condition which will tell you the direction of d epsilon which will tell you the direction of d epsilon for that i have drawn a simple schematic here let us say this is your yield locus okay this is just your yield locus okay so now we are going to pick up the next one another part in that work done which is a half into d epsilon p into d sigma this should also be greater than 0 okay for strain hardening to happen for strain hardening to happen now that is where this fellow comes into picture right so now in this you can say d sigma and d epsilon can be seen as in general as vectors so we can write this as d sigma dot d epsilon should be greater than 0 this means d sigma and d epsilon have a positive projection on one another what does it mean that means uh, is a dot product no positive projection on that means the angle between them is less than 90 degrees so maximum angle it can have is 90 degree between them for any choice of d sigma that produces plastic deformation for any choice of d sigma that produces plastic deformation okay what does it mean that means suppose this is a point i am going to pick up the material is let us say following one particular alpha and reaches this particular point okay so then i am going to draw a tangent i am going to draw a tangent to this and i am going to pick up any choice of d sigma 1 2 3 okay 4 5 6 maybe here also any choice of d sigma i can have the simplest choice of selecting the direction of d epsilon because it can have a maximum angle of 90 degree between them is actually perpendicular tangent drawn here this particular point so i am going to draw a line perpendicular arrow perpendicular to the tangent and that i am going to represent as d epsilon that will be my direction of d epsilon so i have written that the simplest choice of direction of d epsilon is normal to the yield surface f let us say this is your yield locus or surface f okay this choice of direction when you are choosing of d epsilon is called as a normality condition or normality rule okay so the maximum angle it can have is 90 degree okay it can have is 90 degree so the best choice is to pick up a d epsilon direction perpendicular tangent on at any point in the yield locus if you pick up this point then if you draw this tangent then perpendicular to that is a direction of d epsilon that is what is told by this normality condition so if you pick up a, a work done in a closed path in a closed loop okay w1 w2 and they can explain why the yield locus has to be convex at each and every point in the yield locus okay so uh, it has to be convex why because only then your w1 will be greater than 0 only then plastic deformation will happen the way we understand it okay and the other part why or, or the direction of d epsilon how should it be it should be perpendicular to the tangent on at any point in the yield locus and that is mainly because your uh, the angle between any choice of d sigma you pick up the angle between d sigma and d epsilon should be less than 90 degree or maximum it can have is 90 degree okay so this normality condition can be written in a mathematical way in this way of course this can be derived but we have not done it here one should remember this d epsilon ij is equal to d lambda into dou f by dou sigma ij uh, of course uh, there is one small change here you can see this epsilon ij and d sigma ij are writing indical notation okay so uh, which we have not discussed but i think you can go back and refer it the sigma ij is nothing but is going to describe a stress tensor and uh, different elements in the stress tensor and uh, this is going to give you different elements in the strain tensor but the strain increment d epsilon ij would be equal to d lambda into dou f by dou sigma ij where f is your nothing but your yield function that you are going to derive or you already derived it could be tresca yield function or 1 minus yield function okay and uh, d lambda is actually an arbitrary constant uh, we will also see in due course d lambda can be replaced during any derivation okay so this equation significance of equation is basically you can use this equation to find the strain increment suppose if you want to find d epsilon 1 d epsilon 2 d epsilon 3 okay you can partially differentiate the yield function 
which is a function of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. You can differentiate with respect to sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 and then you will get d epsilon 1, 2, 1, 3. That is the significance of this equation. Maybe in the assignments or in the, you know, in the example problem, we can show one or two examples how to get d epsilon 1, 2, 1, 3. Okay. So, with respect to von Mises and Tresca yield function, this is what we discussed and then uh, uh, normality and convexity is true for any yield function which can be simply explained in this way. Okay. So, now let us go to levi Mises flow rule. Okay, the, there are small, small things now. This is very important for us. Okay, why you will know now. So, this levi Mises flow rule okay, uh, is going to tell you something which we already discussed briefly. We said that d matrix test components that is your in principle format you can say sigma 1 dash 2 dash 3 dash together with hydrostatic components make up actual stress state correct that we know. As the hydrostatic stress is unlikely to influence deformation in a solid that deforms at constant volume that is during plastic deformation. Why? We have seen that before in the 3D uh, yield surface. Why hydrostatic part of the stress or hydrostatic stress unlikely to influence the deformation? We have seen during plastic deformation. It may be said that it is the deviatory components okay, that will be the ones associated with the shape change. Right? What do you do in plastic deformation? Okay? This is the hypothesis of levi Mises flow rule. This is the hypothesis of levi Mises flow rule. So, using this, it can also be stated that the ratio of strain increments will be same as the ratio of deviatory stresses. The ratio of strain increments will be same as that of the ratio of deviatory stresses. Strain increments d epsilon 1, d epsilon 2, and d epsilon 3, okay? 1 along length, 2 along width, 3 along the thickness. So, how are they related to length, width and thickness we already seen and uh, given a particular case let us say for example uniaxial or something like that you can relate all these three using constant volume equation correct that you already discussed. Ratio of deviatory stresses, what are deviatory stresses? Sigma 1 dash, 2 dash and 3 dash okay? which can be written, written in a mathematical way in this way like this d epsilon 1 divided by sigma 1 dash equal to d epsilon 2 divided by sigma 2 dash equal to d epsilon 3 divided by sigma 3 dash equal to d lambda. Okay. The same thing written little differently the ratio of strain increments will be same as the ratio of deviatory stresses d epsilon 1 divided by d epsilon 2 will be equal to sigma 1 dash divided by 2 dash. In other way you can write d epsilon 1 divided by sigma 1 dash equal to 2 divided by 2 dash 3 divided by 3 dash. Let us be careful, here it is epsilon, 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 here it is sigma, 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 strain increment, here d vertex stresses that will be equal to d lambda. Okay. So, this is the uh, expression for levi Mises flow rule and uh, with this also you can get strain increments. Okay. You can say d epsilon 1 is nothing but sigma 1 dash into d lambda, correct. Sigma 1 dash is already known to you, it is a function of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 that we already derived right it is a function of sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 okay so in that way you can find d epsilon 1 similarly d epsilon 2 can be found d epsilon 3 can also be found out okay can also be found out if you know sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 okay so now i think this also we derived uh, in the previous class uh, previous uh, discussion isn't it your sigma 1 dash sigma 2 dash and sigma 3 dash as a function of alpha, sigma 1 dash, 2 dash, 3 dash in the function of alpha, I think we already discussed, uh, which means that uh, sigma 3 is not there because you are having only sigma uh, alpha, no? sigma 2 by sigma 1, so which means sigma 3 is not there. We already discussed this, derived this. Okay, so, now what we can do, we can substitute the sigma 1 dash, 2 dash, 3 dash in this equation and we can write d epsilon 1 divided by uh, your 1 by you know your uh, sigma 1 3 sigma 1 3 sigma 3 are common it will it will get removed okay so then you can write d epsilon 1 divided by 2 minus alpha is equal to d epsilon 2 divided by 2 alpha minus 1 is equal to d epsilon 3 divided by minus of 1 plus alpha okay so this equation can be modified to this form using this relationship which you already discussed fine so if a material is deforming in plane stress proportional process, okay, plane stress meaning here sigma 3 equal to 0, proportional process means alpha remains same. Okay. The above equation can be integrated, we have already seen three conditions, right? The above equation can be integrated in terms of true strains and you can modify the previous equation like this. 
Okay. So, what is the equation? d epsilon 1, d epsilon 2, d epsilon 3, 2 minus alpha, 2 alpha minus 1, minus a 1 plus alpha, that is already there here. d epsilon 1 is integrated, so we get epsilon 1, it will become epsilon 2, it will become epsilon 3. These three parts are already known to us. Okay, for a plain stress proportional process, you can write this. Other than these two, there I am going to add two more which will help, which will be helpful for us now. What is this? I am going to, this is completed, this also complete this, completed. Epsilon 2 is nothing but beta into epsilon 1, right? Beta is equal to epsilon 2 divided by epsilon. So, epsilon 2 is equal to beta into epsilon 1. I am going to put here, this will remain same. Okay, epsilon 3 is nothing but minus of 1 plus beta into epsilon 1. This also we derived before which I am going to substitute here divided by minus of 1 plus alpha. It can be rewritten in this way. Epsilon 1 divided by 1 minus alpha equal to epsilon 2 divided by 2 alpha minus 1 is equal to epsilon 2 is equal to beta into epsilon 1. It will give you epsilon 3 is equal to minus of 1 plus beta into epsilon 1 will give me this. Okay? So, now there is one important point that using this equation, we can find the relationship between alpha and beta. Relationship between alpha and beta for an isotropic material. How are we going to find? It is very simple here. Okay. So, now what I am going to do is, I am going to compare this fellow and this fellow. Okay. I am going to compare these two. I will pick up, let us say this. Okay. So, I am going to compare this with this, this part. Okay. So, uh, epsilon 1 and 1 will be cancelled. So, I can directly write beta is equal to 2 alpha minus 1 divided by 2 minus alpha. Right, beta is equal to 2 alpha minus 1 divided by 2 minus alpha. Right, so which is what I have given here, which is what beta is equal to 2 alpha minus 1 divided by 2 minus alpha. Then, of course, you can also get this relationship from this. Okay, alpha is equal to 2 beta plus 1 divided by 2 plus beta. Okay, you can get this relationship from this relationship. You can rewrite this and find out you will be able to get alpha is equal to 2 beta plus 1 divided by 2 plus beta. Okay. So, uh, relationship between stress ratio and uh, strain ratio beta can be obtained from levi meissers flow rule in this way. Okay. So, just to get a quick picture, what is alpha for uniaxial? Alpha for uniaxial is sigma 2 by sigma 1. So, alpha is equal to 0, uniaxial tensile test 0. If you put 0 here, what will happen? Minus 1 by 2. So, beta, uh, so beta will be equal to minus 1 by 2, which is what we have seen in the previous uh, class. Okay. I hope you remember that. Which class we have seen that? It is this particular class. This particular section somewhere we have seen. Yes. Beta is equal to minus half, alpha is equal to 0 for any axial tension test. Right. Right. So, this we have discussed without knowing the relationship. Now, we are proving that if you put alpha is equal to 0, beta will be equal to minus 1 by 2 in any axial tension test that we have already seen. Right, that is what we are getting in this uh, equation also. Right. So, just, just to summarize, there are important points that you should know. Okay. So, it may be seen that while the flow rule, okay, levi meissers flow rule gives relationship between stress and strain ratios alpha and beta, okay, it does not indicate the magnitude of strains. So, magnitude of strains one should get from the original definition. It should just give you the ratio only. If the element deforms under given stress state, let us alpha is known, the ratio of strains can be found from the above equations. Okay, that is what we got just now. Okay. Just to give you a quick picture of this entire thing in one diagram, okay, some of this you have not discussed much, but I am just going to summarize that. Okay, this is one diagram, okay, you have got both strain increment as well as principal stresses. Sigma 1 in y axis, sigma 2 in x axis, d epsilon 1 in y axis, d epsilon 2 in x axis. Both are drawn here, which means alpha and beta can be represented in one diagram. right? So, five different uh, you know, alphas and betas are given. 1, 2, this is 3, this is 4 and this fellow is going to be 5. Five different. Uh, I was telling you when we are discussing about alpha and beta that only uniaxial that is the case. right? So, there could be many other alpha and beta values, prominent of them are these five. Of course, you can have in between also. In between also you can have, but these are all prominent ones. We'll let us quickly discuss about it. Let us pick up this particular line. Let us pick up this particular line. Okay. So here you will see that uh, uh, this is both are one. Okay. Let us say, for example, you have uh, 
uh, sigma 1 equal to sigma 2. So, alpha is equal to 1. Uh, so, alpha is equal to 1 here. Alpha is equal to 1 if you substitute in the previous equation. 2 minus 1, 2 divided by 2. So, beta is equal to 1. Which means d epsilon 2 will be equal to d epsilon 2. Fine. So, now let us pick up this particular stress path where it is sigma 2 by sigma 1 is let us say 1 by 2. 1 by 2. Okay. So, let us put alpha is equal to 1 by 2 here. What will happen? Alpha is equal to 1 by 2. So, 1 minus 1. So, gone. So, beta is equal to 0. That means d epsilon 2 is 0. Right. This is a known thing for us y axis along y axis this particular stress path is known thing for us right why because uh, here you are sigma 2 is uh, 0 that means uh, it is uniaxial so which means uh, alpha is equal to 0 if alpha is equal to 0 we have already seen that beta is equal to minus half which is what i written d f slant is equal to minus of d f slant 1 divided by 2 so d f slant 2 divided by d f slant 1 is minus half this is on the other side okay this is on the other side so what is uh, alpha here so, this is going to be my alpha. Alpha is uh, let us say 2 by 1 which is minus 1. Okay. If it is minus 1, alpha is minus 1, what will happen? So, this is um, uh, minus 2 minus 1 divided by uh, your, uh, 3, minus 3 which will be minus 1. This is minus 1. So, beta is nothing but minus 1. Alpha is minus 1, beta is also minus 1 like that. Okay. And this is actually just opposite in this direction, in this direction. So, one can work it out and find out that this is nothing but beta is equal to minus 2, beta is equal to minus 2. So, you will see that your uh, beta value is going to move from beta is equal to minus 1 here, okay. it is going to cross beta 0 and then beta as minus 1 by 2 and then beta as minus 1 and then you are getting beta as minus 2. So, it starts from 1, it goes up to minus 2. That is what is shown in this diagram. And uh, we have already seen in this diagram, the deep drawing one part of the component I have shown here, no? Uh, this part. So, you can coincide this diagram with uh, this diagram which I have shown and you can see what type of uh, things are going to come uh, in which uh, part of uh, different deforming uh, when you deform the cup, right? So, you can coincide these two because that is also sigma 1 is a sigma 2, here also sigma 1 is a sigma 2. So, you can find out where it is going to come. Okay. So, uh, a brief explanation for this, with this we, are, we will stop it here. Okay. So, we are going to say that uh, a simple example problem I have just shown here. The current flow strength of a material element is 300 MPa. Okay. The current flow strength, let us say you are, we do not, current flow strength means we do not know what is it. So, we, we write sigma f is equal to 300 MP. In a deformation process, the principal strain increments are 0 0.012 and 0 0.007, right. So, uh, the larger value, you can always take it as 1, okay. So, I am writing d epsilon 1 as 0 0.012, okay, and uh, my d epsilon 2 as 0 0.007 in 1 and 2 directions, it is already given. Determine the principal stresses associated with this in a plane stress process. The question is given, so we can directly say sigma 3 is equal to 0. So, it is a sigma 3 equal to 0 process. Okay. What do you want to find? You need to find principal stresses. So, you need to find sigma 1 comma sigma 2 only. Okay. Sigma 3 is known. So, how do you proceed? Whenever you have got a strain increment, directly you can find out beta. This is the way you have to think about. Okay. So, whenever you have strain increment, one thing directly you can get it is uh, your beta. So, I have written here that beta is equal to d epsilon 2 by d epsilon 1 is nothing but 0 0.07 divided by 0 0.012 to 0 0.583. So, beta is equal to 0 0.583, right? Beta is equal to 0 0.583 means it is somewhere in between these two, isn't it? This is beta is equal to 1, this is beta is equal to 0, 0 0.583 means it is somewhere in between, it is somewhere in between 0 0.5, 0 0.6 you can keep. Okay. So, it is somewhere in between. That is what is just a simple reference to that. So, beta is found out. Alpha can be found out, right? 2 beta plus 1 divided by 2 plus beta, which you already derived. So, you substitute beta value in this equation. You will get 0 0.839. That is alpha. That is all. So, what do we need? We need sigma 1 and sigma 2. So, alpha is known, which means sigma 1 can be found out first. Okay. How do you find out sigma 1? 
sigma 1 is nothing but sigma f divided by square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square. So, how do you get this? This you are getting from 1 minus yield function. Unless otherwise said, we are going to follow 1 minus for all the problems. We just derived this. We just now derived, isn't it? This equation. Where is it? This equation comes here. Yes, this equation, no? This fellow. This equation. So, sigma 1 we need to find out, which is nothing but sigma f divided by square root of 1 minus alpha plus alpha square. Okay, and sigma f is already given, the current strength or flow strength is already given. 300 MPa. So, this would be your 300 divided by square root of 1 minus 0 0.839 plus 0 0.839 square will give you, you can calculate it, it should be about 323 MPa. That is all. If alpha is known, then uh, alpha into sigma 1 will be 271 MPa. This is the root. Whenever new dimension and old dimensions are given or whenever strain increments are given directly, okay, you can use this. Okay. If strains are not given and if it is original new dimensions are given, then you have to calculate sigma d epsilon 1, d epsilon 2 to get beta. Then you can get alpha. By knowing alpha and by knowing current force strength, you can get the principal stress. Okay, one, the first principal stress. By knowing alpha, you can get a sigma 2, which is nothing but sigma. Next principal stress. 323, 271, 0. Okay. Together is going to cause this particular force strength as a 300 MPa. But whether this is less than the yield strength of the material or greater than, we do not know. So, only this much of information we can get from this particular problem. Okay. So, we are stopping here and we will continue our discussion in the next part. Thank you. Thank you.